So we've been talking about properties of water, and so we're going to pick up and do the last little section of this today. So in the lab, we're actually going to be looking at uh, soapy water versus regular water and how soap changes its properties. So I wanted to just show you a very quick slide. So soap is what's called a surfactant. So things like oil and water don't mix. Going back to yesterday's information, you may recall that water is polar. And what that means is, sorry, um, that it has partial charges. The oxygen pulls harder on the electrons than the hydrogens do, and that created partial charges. The oxygen was slightly negative, the hydrogens are slightly positive, and this causes it to then also be attracted to other things like ions, like this hydrogen might be attracted to a chloride ion because it would have a negative charge and those opposite charges would attract, and it also causes waters to be attracted to other waters. Um, for example, the hydrogen could be attracted to the oxygen of a second water. And this caused water to have properties like cohesion, sticking to itself, adhesion, sticking to other things, as well as surface tension, where the surface of the water forms this almost like film because of these water molecules tightly, tightly attracted to one another. So what a surfactant does, the reason why, if you remember that oil is nonpolar, so oil and water don't mix. So you'd have oil and water, and you could shake it up all you wanted, and they would still separate. What a surfactant does, a surfactant has, I like the way they simplify it here, one side that's nonpolar and one side that's polar, but within the same molecule. So when you add a surfactant to something like oil and water, the surfactant allows the nonpolar and polar to mix. It sort of holds hands with both at the same time. And that is going to lower the surface tension of the water. So, for example, a little thing couldn't necessarily walk on the top of water if you had uh, oil in water and a, or had a surfactant added. Um, but it also would allow you to clean the oils and things off your skin or clean up dishes. So our last section is going to be a little bit about acids and bases. It turns out that water itself can break into ions. Now this is a very tiny, tiny thing. About one in every 550 million water molecules is doing this. One in five, so this is a tiny, tiny amount. One times 10 to the negative 14th, point zero 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 per mole of water, uh, which is a, a measurement of an amount of water. 13 zeros and a one is how many water molecules would be doing this per uh, a, huge number of water molecules. But when it does happen, it breaks into H and OH. And these two things would be equal to one another. Hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions is what these are called. These would be equal. The H plus would be equal to the number of OH minuses, which makes sense because if a water breaks, it's got to break into exactly one of each of those, right? So anything that adds more hydrogen ions to water is an acid. And anything that adds more OHs is a base. So normally in water, these are balanced. In fact, the amount of, of either one of these is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th of each. So if we add more hydrogens, it becomes acidic. If, if we add more OHs, it becomes basic, or another word for that is alkaline. Now it turns out we can measure how acidic or alkaline something is using a pH scale. 7 is considered neutral on the pH scale. So water has an, a pH of exactly 7. Um, the pH, it's calculated. It's actually a formula. We don't really talk about it in here because most of you, your math, you haven't done logs yet in math, but it's a formula. The negative log of the hydrogen concentration gives us the pH. But I will tell you this, kind of a little shortcut. If the hydrogen concentration was... 10 to the negative 7th, if you take the negative log of that number, the pH is actually 7. So that exponent would actually become the pH. So you can easily convert from how much hydrogen there is or how many hydrogen ions there are to the pH. But anyway, above 7 is a base, below 7 is an acid, and 7 is neutral. So our stomach, for example, has a pH of about 2. So it's a, it's a strongly acidic environment. Um, on the other hand, our small intestine, which is where our food goes after our stomach, it has a pH of about 8, so it's a little bit basic or alkaline. So 
all you would really want to be able to do for test purposes for our chapter, because you'll get a lot more of this in chemistry, is answer questions like this. So which one would be a stronger acid, tomato juice or stomach acid? So right here, here's seven, this would be neutral. As we go down from neutral, all of these are acids, but the lower the pH goes, the stronger the acid. So tomato juice is here, but stomach acid is all the way down here, closer to one. So the one that would be the stronger acid would be stomach acid. All right, what about the strongest base on this chart? Well, again, everything above seven is a base, but the further up we go, the stronger the base. So the highest number here is 14, and the closest to that would be our oven cleaner, which looks like it's at about 13.5. Yes, you can have decimals for pHs. Milk, is it an acid or a base? Well, its pH is below seven, it might be 6.5, which is close to 7, but this would still be an acid. It would just be a very weak acid. So milk would be a very weak acid. So just make sure you know how to read a chart like that. And last but not least, buffers. So we're not going to go into a lot of details about buffers, but just be aware that your body has these things called buffers. And what they are, they're very weak acids or bases. And what they do is they react with strong acids and bases, and, they, and ultimately... Here's all you got to know. Buffers tend to prevent your pH from changing too much. So buffers in your blood can keep your pH from going out of whack. So your blood is a pH normally of, I think it's like 7.3. It's not quite neutral, but it's close. If you breathe too, quite too fast, um, you basically exhale too much carbon dioxide, and you... Um, you then, this is a, a picture of the reaction that actually happens. So if you're breathing too fast, you have too much carbon dioxide and it makes this reaction sort of go this way. Um, if you breathe too slow, there's too much carbon dioxide in the blood. So you're, because you build it up in your cells and the reaction goes this way. But either way, what a buffer would do is it would try to keep everything stable. So think of a buffer as something that could either pick up hydrogens if there's too many, so you could add hydrogens to the buffer, or if there's not enough hydrogens in the solution, it could sort of give them away. You don't have to know this uh, equation here or anything like that. Just know that. Just know that buffers prevent pH changes by either adding in hydrogens if there's not enough, or taking them away if there's too many. All right, now I'm going a little out of order, but I realized that I skipped this section in my videos, so I wanted to go back and just touch on this in case you're using it to study for our next test. So when we talked about isotopes, just a reminder, isotopes had different numbers of neutrons, but were still the same element. It's possible sometimes that an isotope has so many neutrons that it actually makes the nucleus unstable. And we played with this in the lab in that little um, online simulation. I showed you that if you kept adding neutrons, it would say that the nucleus was unstable. And it turns out that there's a name for that. Those are called radioactive isotopes. And they are unstable in the sense that they will actually break down over time. Um, it's called decay, radioactive decay. Um, and there's different kinds of radioactive decay. But we have uses for these radioactive isotopes. Now, they don't necessarily, um, they're not necessarily dangerous. Some of them can be. I mean, uranium, you don't necessarily want to come, come in contact with certain ones like uranium and 238 or something like that. But carbon-14, for example, is, is around us in small amounts, and we, we're not harmed by it. So they're not necessarily dangerous just because you hear the word radioactive, even though, yes, some radioactivity can be dangerous. Anyway, this is an example. This is carbon-12, six protons, six neutrons. Oopsies. Uh, this is carbon-13. Notice it has seven neutrons. And then carbon-14, it has eight neutrons. So the only thing that's changing here is the number of neutrons. And this one is unstable. Uh, in our little activity, you saw this one, like it showed the nucleus sort of shaking because it was unstable. So what carbon-14 does over time is it breaks down at what's called a half-life. And it's an amount of time um, for about half of that isotope to decay, and it actually turns into uh, a different isotope. And in the case of carbon-14, it actually turns into nitrogen-14. And it's really slow. It does this um, for carbon-14, a half-life is about 5,730 years. So when that amount of time goes by, about half is gone. And then when, a, when another half-life goes by, 
Now it would go from, if you imagine it this way, it would go from half to then after a second half-life, there'd only be a quarter left. After a third half-life, there'd only be an eighth of that left. And so uh, this would be another 5,730 years and another 5,730 years and another 5,730, et cetera. Why is this important? Well, a couple of things. One, there's some medical uses for these. Because they are unstable, they actually give off, um, like under x-rays, you can see them. They glow. The radioactivity shows up. So we can do things like a PET scan with radioactive isotopes, uh, an angiogram where they inject the isotope into your blood, and it'll actually look for blockages. You could find like heart blockages or brain blockages using an angiogram. You can also use these isotopes for certain cancer treatments like thyroid cancer. If you've ever heard of somebody going through radiation, they're using a radioactive isotope in that case to kill cancer cells. Um, and we can use them for fossil dating. Because they do decay over a period of time, some of them that have a slow half-life and decay very slowly can be used to date different kinds of ice, um, fossils. So in this case, this Iceman, um, he was dated using carbon-14, and we estimate the age of this fossil to be 5,300 years old based on how much carbon-14 has broken down into nitrogen over time. These dinosaur bones, uh, this dinosaur Sue, was very famous actually, was dated using a different isotope, uranium-238. Uranium it has a slower half-life. It breaks down more slowly than carbon-14, but they used, again, this isotope to date it at about 67 million years old. So those are some uses in science and medicine for radioactive isotopes.